Well, for more on what he's watching, let's bring in Scott Ladner, CIO of Horizon Investments. Scott, thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. Hey, Jacqueline, thanks for having me. So it seems like in investors are liking or they're, they're, uh, the U.S. markets are appealing at this point in the year so far. And the U.S. is also a place that, uh, that you're very much in, interested in right now. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, why you see potential in the U.S.? Yeah, sure. Look, I mean, it's it's the it's a similar story as we've been talking about for the better part of a year now. Um, you, we frankly have never seen the recession case in the U.S. is holding a lot of water. Um, people that have looked at this economy and these markets through the through the lens of kind of a, a traditional business cycle, we think. Uh, we think that's probably not the right framework uh, for, for thinking about how things have been going. Think more of like a war and war recovery type of framework uh, is more applicable to what's what's really happened over the last couple of years. And in the in a framework like that, if that's how you're thinking about the world, um, you know, you, it's the, this this disinflation pr uh, process that we're on, that we're undergoing through right now, uh, the very strong consumer and very strong fiscal uh, impulse we've had um, sort of around the world, but especially in the United States uh, over the last eighteen months has been very helpful. And we see again, we see companies continue to earn and and uh, and hire folks. Uh, and retain employees, and so yeah, that's that's just not the makeup for a really a bad bear market outcome. Um, you, know, you really need uh, some some sort of outside shock to, to to induce that, and we're just not seeing that right now. Yeah, just how different is that sort of recovery scenario? If you are thinking uh, coming out of a, a a war or something, a, a big event like that, versus um, you know the the business cycle that you mentioned. Yeah, look. If, if you look at a business cycle, then you look at uh, you know a lot of like leading economic indicators. So you look, you know, you look at inver inverted yield curves. You look at money supplies. You look at PMI statistics and ISM statistics. You know, there there are, there are a bunch of things that that typically happen in the course of a business cycle that just aren't applicable if you're if you're in more of like a war and war recovery type of period. Like in a war period, you have massive fiscal you know massive fiscal spending. You have supply uh, chain dislocations. Uh, you have employment dislocations. Um, and once the you know once the war is over and you get the recovery period, it ends up being a pretty quick normalization process um, but it, but it is it is very abrupt and so you know what you know one thing that could definitely mark uh, the last couple of years is, is, is abruptness uh, to both to both markets and economic statistics um, and that's and that's what we think we're going through it's just a very quick normalization process and a lot of these numbers um, and you know it's, it's going to lead for the for central banks especially the Fed to cut rates uh, pretty aggressively this year because there's no reason to have rates really really high when you're at you know, when, when employment and inflation you know their two big mandates are basically where they need them to be. So if you're expecting pretty aggressive rate cuts, um, what sort of sectors do you think are going to benefit the most from that? You know, we, we we continue to like technology. I mean, I know it's probably it's probably boring to say because it's been the case for a while. Um, but but you know, tech, especially big tech, uh, continues to be pretty interesting because they are the, these are the companies that earn the most of anybody in the world. They just print cash. They're also the place uh, that's going to have the most uh, you know, most to benefit uh, from what's continuing to happen with AI. You know, I think that probably the first leg of the AI trade is done. Like the, the hardware part of the AI trade is probably done. Um, that's a semiconductor trade, really. Um, the the second part of the AI trade is how are companies going to use it. You know, how are companies going to going to use the, the productivity gains um, out of AI to actually improve the processes and get something, get a statistic, something like uh, like revenue per worker, which has been stagnant for almost 25 years, get that number starting to go up again. That's a really strong productivity type of indicator. Um, and 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 you know, the the smaller tech companies, not small, but smaller tech companies, uh, we think are probably the next leg uh, for for that rally. Yeah, I mean, I don't think tech is boring right now, Scott, because we have seen such a run, especially for these these big companies last year. And then the question was. Can it keep going from from that level? But you you know it sounds like you're talking a little bit more broader. You said you know small, but I mean smaller companies, but also just how companies overall are sort of integrating artificial intelligence and technology in what they do. No, exactly right. So I mean, you think you know, think about pharmaceutical companies, mm. um, you know, in terms, of, in terms of drug testing. You know, think about industrial companies in terms of you know some supply chain logistics and uh, you know, uh, making those making those processes smarter. Think about retailers and, and and inventory management, and you know, especially on the high end. You know, they, you know these these are these are firms and, and sectors that haven't haven't really been loved very much over the last year. Um, but there, but you know, there are certainly names inside of there inside of those sectors that are that can benefit a ton from what's going on with AI and, and eventually with quantum computing. Um, but but we've just we you know. The market hasn't really recognized yet. We think, we think 2024 it might be the year that the market starts to recognize some of those gains. Scott, just very quickly, um, you like tech. You're staying away from consumer staples, though. 
Yeah, look, Staples, Staples were, were obviously a great trade in 2022 because you had sort of the you know dual dual boogeymen, uh, you know, of everybody expecting a recession, even though when when never happened, uh, you know, expecting a recession plus inflationary pressures. They, that, those are those are two really good things if you're a consumer Staples investor. Um, neither one of those two catalysts are on the horizon right now, and so we just you don't think you, you necessarily lose money in Staples, but Staples are certainly not going to keep picking, you know keep up with a rising market that we expect in 2024. Scott, great to check in with you. Thanks so much for. For, for your ideas this afternoon. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Jacqueline. Appreciate it. That was Scott Ladner, CIO at Horizon Investments. And we were taking a look at the S&P 500 as it's poised to reach a, another all-time high today after already hitting that record level last Friday. But what about its valuation? Well, our next guest believes the benchmark index isn't as expensive as it seems. For more, let's bring in Drew Pettit. He's a U.S. equity strategist at City Research. Drew, thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. Well, thanks for having me. So uh, give us a sense of how you're looking at the, the valuation of the S&P 500, or perhaps maybe starting with more typically how one might look at the valuation and then how you are. So I've been caught on camera quipping about this, that the S&P 500 isn't the same as it was in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, or even the 80s. So I'm not going to apologize for being younger here, <laughs> but we have to realize that the index has evolved. It's grown. It's a different animal. But what people typically do is just look at an index PE and compare it versus history. I can sit here like a lot of other strategists and spit out stats like, all since the 1960s, the average multiple is under 17 times. It's closer to 16 and a half. That's how people typically look at this. So when they say we're trading at 22 times trailing earnings, that's not comparing apples to apples. So I think that's how people typically look at the S&P, and that's not how we do it on our team. Because the makeup of it has changed so much <laughs> over the years. Yeah, so right now, more than 40% of the S&P is in growth type sectors. That's tech, for example, that's communication services. Years ago, the S&P was much more cyclically led. So a lot more industrials, a lot more banks, and those have different growth profiles. So investors pay different multiples for those types of stocks. So how, how do you end up looking at this then uh, to, to get a, you know, a, a, a valuation that you think is more appropriate? Yeah, so we look at this from a bottom up perspective you're not going to hear this a lot when you go around the street, but we looked at all the individual components, all 500 components of the S&P, well, 503 to be exact right now, <laughs> and we looked at their valuations versus their own history. And what we found when we took a weighted average of all that is our valuation today is not as high as what we've seen in previous peaks. So our valuation is actually lower than the last time we were at 4,800. So that's so we were just showing your first graph, and that was uh, that was the when you're looking at 22 times trailing earnings, then you're at the 92nd percentile. Um, but if we look at the next one, um, when it shows at the 78th percentile, that's when you're using this bottom up approach. Exactly, and uh, to make life easy for all your viewers, think of it this way: our 78th percentile in our city valuation composite is actually more like a 19 times PE. So I'm not going to come out here and say the S&P is cheap back up the truck. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to say is valuation really isn't what's going to drive the market higher from here, but we're not as expensive as you think. So 22 times what we see when we look at the S&P from a traditional perspective is actually something more like 19 times. It's going to behave more like a 19 times market than it is a 22 times market. And so I know you get this question a, a, a lot, Drew. People ask you, so is it expensive? I mean, when you're even just talking 19 times, <clears throat> if you're using your uh, method there, what do you think? So from here, every gain is going to be driven by earnings and earnings growth. So when I've been on before and when we talk to clients, we always lead with growth and fundamentals. So from here, we expect fundamentals to grow you know, low double digits. That's what's going to drive gains, not this kind of early cycle phenomenon where we can get a lot of re-rating of the index. Underneath the surface, it's a little bit different. You know, I, I heard some of your prior guests talk about tech in different parts of the growth side of the market. That is much more expensive versus its history. That should de-rate, as in we should, you know, pay a lower PE for those names, but they have much stronger growth. So the stock prices can still go higher. It's the other part of 
parts of the market, specifically the cyclicals. So think industrials and financials here that can actually re-rate because they're trading well below their longer term averages. So that's where you get the double whammy of my multiple, my PE, my price to book, my EV to EBITDA, whatever the key valuation metric is for that stock, that can move higher while the key uh, fundamental metrics can also grow. Drew, I just wanted to get your thoughts, too, on uh, just where the S&P 500 is trading right now. You were thinking uh, previously that it was going to be, you know, 4,800 middle of this year. We're past that point now. I mean, I, I wonder if you were expecting uh, uh, or a bit surprised maybe to see that happen so soon. Has it changed your thinking about where we will be mid-year or where we will be by the end of the year for the S&P 500? Oh, look, I think the 4,800 mid-year target is more telling the story that don't expect this to move in a straight line. We had a sell-off to start the year, and we've rebounded those gains. But we're moving into earnings season right now, and we should see some estimates for earnings in those key fundamentals actually come down. Um, on top of this, we're talking about a Fed rate-cutting cycle that I don't think there's really agreement on when that's going to begin. So, yeah, we're at 4,800 now. Expect some chop until we're past some of these key events in the first part of the year. But look, we're still looking for, you know, mid to high single digits upside in the S&P to close the year at around 5,100. Okay.